Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is Deirdre McCloskey. She's the Distinguished Professor of Economics, History, English, and Communications at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And today we're talking about an essay she wrote for an upcoming volume edited by Ben Powell on prospects for libertarianism. The essay is called Manifesto for a New American Liberalism or How to Be a Humane Libertarian. Welcome back to Free Thoughts. Yes. Th thank you very much. Glad to be here. You begin the essay by talking about liberalism 1.0. Yes. What is that? Well, this is a, a, a coinage by Dan Klein, an economist friend of mine. And he, he's making the point and I'm making the point that we, we free countries were once, once liberal in my sense and in Dan's sense and in Tocqueville's sense and in uh, Adams's sense and so forth that it was a we were free economies without much in the way of of uh, government intervention. And then in both England and the United States, especially the United States, the word liberal was, so to speak, taken over by what I call slow socialists. And they're my friends. I, mean, I don't think they're evil uh, people, but for about 100 years, the word has meant in the United States larger and larger uh, government. What is slow socialism as opposed to fast? Well, socialism? fast socialism would be 1917 and communism okay. or, or the horror of Venezuela these days. But uh, we – I was once a, a Marxist, and then I was a, I was a Keynesian, and that's kind of slow socialism. You one to, takes the view that the 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 government is is very nice and <laughs> is very competent, and so we need more of that and less uh, e economic freedom. Is it slow socialism because it has no principled stopping point? It has no. That's a very good way to express it. I'm going to adopt that, that way of saying it. I'm going to steal it immediately because <laughs> that's the point. There's no, there's no limit if, uh, if, if, if the nanny state, as it's often called, uh, thinks you should go to bed at 8 o'clock, then there's soon – well, you, you know, every day we get more news of this. In the state of Tennessee, if you want to open a moving company, a furniture moving company, you have to get the permission of the existing movie company and moon, uh, moving companies. So you can imagine how that works out. Certificates of need. Certificates. If you want to braid hair, you need a you need a license from the government, and this is crazy. So I mean, but what's wrong with? I mean, fast socialism seems to have a bad track record, but yeah. What's wrong with slow socialism? I mean, don't we need these kinds of rules if we're going we're gonna to live together in a complex society where all of our actions impact each other? Um, we've got to follow rules and we've got to have some way to use the government to make sure that that society works for everyone, that that's it takes right. the shape that we want it to. There you go. That's the, that's the standard argument and I used to use it when I was a kid and, and uh, Bernie Sanders uses it. And, and, and my, my friends on the left use it all the time that the more complicated the economy, the more regulations we need. And of course, it's actually kind of the opposite. The more complicated the economy, the more we need to re rely on the immensely complicated plans of individuals and, and, and trust. Not a blind trust, but a but a certain trust in the market. If the market results in uh, global warming and air pollution, then there's a case for some intelligent piece of government intervention. But in general, we should let the market work. You know, I I, I came here in an Uber ca ta taxi, and it's it's a it's a cheaper and better service. It's being ferociously opposed by every taxi monopoly in the world. In Germany, they've made it illegal. But that's how the economy should work. People, as the English say, they have an expression, having a go. <laughs> and allowing people to have a go is pretty – has worked out very well. I think that Aaron made a – the way he said his counter argument was something he said society – 
is shaped the way we want it or something yeah. like that. Yeah. That, that seems to be an interesting the, you know, people say that the, yeah, the, the government can make sure the society is shaped well, the, the way we want it, and they kind of gloss over how kind of crazy, how that hard it is to is. do. I mean, yes. they, they'll, the 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 key word here, and I urge you all to watch it when it happens, is the word designed. Designed to do such and with such. It's it's a lawyer's word. It's not something that a that a. Uh, I don't know, a person who actually understands society a, a little bit would use because design is very hard to undertake. Look, if you're, if you're engaged in a war for, for survival, then design is really what you want. You want General Grant or, or General Lee, for that matter, to be focused on the one thing and then, it, then you kind of know what you need to do. But <laughs> for, for something as complicated and rich as a advancing economy, an economy in which the poor are get, getting much be, better off than they once were, design is so often doesn't work. The other one is we. The, well, the, that's the, right, the, we, because the only we we have is the government, and this we-ness is a, is a problem. You know, we want to... In, in turn the Japanese. <laughs> we want to invade Iraq. We, we, we. I think also in design in particular, there's a, there's a loss of the sense of costs. Yeah. Uh, because I mean, so design in design context, like you're doing, you're yeah. designing a new product, you know, yeah. every now and then they'll do these things like a new iPhone comes out and they'll, yeah, yeah. they'll tear it down. Um, some tech site will tear it down and they'll add up the cost of the components. They'll be yeah. like, this phone actually only cost X dollars to make, but they're selling it for two or three X. Right. You know, where's all that extra cost? And the cost is that the design process yeah. was so expensive and so wasteful. You know, you, yeah. you try it, it doesn't work. You scrap sure. it, you try it again. But we we seem to think that design, when government does it, doesn't work that well, way. The design is just you have right. like this abstract idea and then you apply it. That's and it right. And, and, and the key sort of ideology behind the left – and behind this slow socialism is that the economy is easy. You, you, you can come up with that all the time. People are saying, well, you know, we'll, we'll subsidize, um, we'll subsidize um, uh, um, solar panels. That'll be easy. Everyone knows that solar panels made in the United States are the ones we want. And then you l lose half a billion dollars, which is what the Solyndra fiasco is all about. And it's, I'm not making uh, out that the Obama administration was terrible at this, but but it is that they think, and this is a very deep presumption, especially by people who have never been on a farm or who have never been, weren't raised in a small grocery store where they worked. They, I find that my, my students who are raised in small businesses like small farms. They understand economics. They understand there's no free lunch. They understand the price system. Whereas if you grow up like I did as the child of, a, of an academic, actually, a professor, you, you don't know what your father does. You know that your mother's a central planner in the household. And you think, gee, let's make this, let's make this national. <laughs> Why not central planning for 324 million people in the United States? It definitely seems that – but that's a really good way of describing Paul Krugman, for example, exactly. that the economy is easy. Now, what about – we're talking about the socialists on the, on the left, the so-called liberals. What about conservatives? Are well, they an issue? My, yeah, there sure is. My view is that conservatives we, – we as free market advocates, as, as Catoites, we ought to be trying to occupy the middle. This thing that just happened in France with Macron – by the way, I was at a, 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 at a dinner party in Paris a couple of months ago before the election and I pointed out to the assembled group that Macron – in ancient Greek means big deal. <laughs> and it is a big deal that he's occupied the middle with real liberalism. That is, freedom for people so far as social matters are concerned, transgendered people or, or uh, uh, people from M M Morocco and so forth on the one hand, 
and uh, and fiscal responsibility on the other. So taking the best of the Democrats and the Republicans, so to speak, in France, the conservatives and the uh, socialists. So I, I, I think there's a middle ground that free, free market advocates should be assuming. We, are, we, we should be taking it. We are the radicals, as we once were, of course. We are the ones who can stand b between these two. But, you know, the, the, look, you know someone's a conservative if, unlike me, they think that the 1960s was the beginning of the rut. If they say, ah, oh, the women came out of the kitchen and started messing around with flying airplanes and so on, and, and, the, uh, and those damn blacks or darn blacks or however you want to express it, they started to get uppity and, and, uh, and these queers, they got out of the closet and these colonial people, once they had it all well organized in the, in the British and French and empires and now they've gotten around, oh, I hate it, I hate it. And you know... A progressive, in a deep sense, is someone who believes the 1960s were the great was the beginning of the modern era of freedom, of liberation, and we have to get across somehow to our audience and beyond our audience that institutions like Cato and and uh, and the Charles uh, 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 Koch Institute and others are <laughs> their view of the 60s is precisely that it was the beginning of true true freedom. But there's a, there's a view the progressives and they look back on the 60s and then they look at the great society laws. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, That's the other set. That's the slow socialist coming. Yeah, you're sure. right so about that. So what do we say? So what, what they say is like, look, that the, the two things go hand in hand, mm -hmm. that we stopped – oppressing people, yeah, we stopped yeah, marginalizing people, and we we brought them into society, but that part of what that means is then taking care of each other, the yeah, being part of the society. So what do what do we I'm in a, that radical center? I I'm suppose? an Abrahamic socialist. Jewish uh, You mean Abraham, like the Abraham. The <laughs> Abraham, Abraham, the uh, named Abram. Um uh, 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 Christian, Muslim. I'm a actually I'm an Anglican. I'm an Episcopalian, and I believe that we do have a responsibility to the poor. But our responsibility is to is to, is to give them opportunity to make sure they're not serfs of the uh, uh, of the public schools. That they're uh, you know look. I I come from Chicago. And the, the south and west sides of Chicago are really in terrible shape. That doesn't mean there's not a, a vital and large black middle class, but there's also a not so vital and very poor black underclass. The south and west sides of Chicago ought to be hives of industrial activity. They were in the 19th and early 20th century. There was no problem getting a job in the 19, 1920s in Chicago. And the, but we put obstacles in the way. We have, we have interventions in the wage bargain, so-called uh, uh, protections of various kinds, such as the minimum wage, that make it impossible for a person who's not worth $12 an hour, or 15 or 10 or whatever it is, to be hired by anyone. And then we have zoning, which makes it impossible to open a factory on the west side of Chicago, as you so could. And, and if, if you didn't think that was enough to stop enterprise, we have this war on drugs, which tur turns the south and west parts of the south and west side into, into free fire zones. And this is very bad for the poor. And unfortunately, lots of these things are outgrowths of this regulatory impulse, longstanding. As you say, it starts with American progressivism 100 years ago, and then it's ramped up in the 30s, and then especially, as you pointed out, in the, in, in the great society programs of the 60s. And we ought to step back. We ought to have, you, you could call them by various names. We ought to have enterprise zones, for example. There's a new word that is um, being used a lot, and it makes me cringe whenever I, I see it used. And since it's in liberalism, and now we're neoliberalism, and I feel yeah. like anytime anyone uses that word, they're 
derogatory. They're saying it's something a term bad. of contempt. I I was at a small conference at my university at UIC with my colleagues. I'm a professor of English and uh, history as well and as economics, and they were mainly from English and econo- uh, history, and they had brought this uh, Marxoid from New York, a smart guy who talked about economic history in, in the United States since the war, and, you know, some of his points were good and some of them weren't so good, and I, I, I stood up and very politely said, you know, maybe you should change such and such in your argument, and <laughs> I'm an economic historian. I'm not an unknown figure in this, and <laughs> he said... Here's what, he, here's what happened. He said, I see that you're a neoliberal and sat down. That was his reply. And what I found very distressing is my colleagues didn't say, well, you know, come on. Deirdre McCluskey might have a little standing to talk a tiny bit about economic history. Maybe you better actually answer her. But they didn't do it. You'd mentioned that you – were at one time a Marxist I was. and moved through this progression. I was this, kind this of a Joan Baez Marxist. Okay. So, so how, you were just in it for the folk music. Tiny bit simple-minded. I how did say. how did you change your mind? Well, very slowly. I mean, I, I was at Harvard College. Um, you know, Bernie Sanders and uh, um, Jeremy Corbyn and I in, say, 1960, we're about the same age, we all had the same opinion. Uh, capitalism is the problem. Uh, let's have a, have a revolution. The problem is that those two guys haven't changed their opinion. I've changed my opinion on lots of things, including my gender. Uh, but <laughs> I, I then became a Keynesian because that was what was on offer in the economics department. I, 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 I wanted to help the poor, so I became an economist. And then I became a kind of social engineer. We were going to come down to Washington. We was at Harvard in graduate school, and we were going to fine-tune the economy, you know. And, and then I started to apply economics to economic history, and I realized that these tools, these basic tools of economics, supply and demand curves and so on, make a lot of sense and are, are useful for history. Then I got a job at the University of Chicago in 1968. I taught there for 12 years. And then uh, in 1974, uh, Robert Nozick's book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, sort of solidified it for me. And then I continued to drift somewhat more slowly in the next couple, three, four de- uh, um, decades. And now I describe myself, as I said, as a Christian real liberal and a um, – uh, as a kind of Austrian economist much more than I was, and uh, and I speak in terms of humanomics. I'm trying to combine the humanities and the social sciences in a serious way. So I've, you know, my hero, my heroine is Mae West, who was brilliant. She was a comedian in the, in the movies in the 30s. And she said, I was Snow White, but I drifted. <laughs> come up and see me sometime. I was say, come up and see me sometime. <laughs> I, 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 I am in favor of the institution of marriage, but I'm not ready for an institution. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think, would you drift all the way to anarchism? No. In fact, I, in fact my first politics was anarchism, oddly enough. I at the Carnegie Library in Wakefield, Massachusetts, built by Andrew Carnegie, I found Prince Kropotkin's book, Mutual Aid, when I was about 15 years old, and it blew me away. He was a prince of the uh, Russian Empire and an anarchist, unfortunately a left anarchist, so he believed the problem was the state. I still agree with them there. And then the other problem is ownership and capitalism. And that's where I parted slowly. Uh, so no, I, I've, I'm, I have a nostalgic affection for anarchists. When we talk, when we talk about taking away some of these controls that the, the government controls, protections that the government has put on us over yeah, the last so century. Yeah, protection. It seems to me that aside from people's objections, you know, we, our food is going to be 
polluted. Our air is going to be polluted. People are going to be. Yeah. But the big, the big one that is really important now for the conversation is inequality. It keeps changing what is important. True. true. Now but it's inequality. Now it's inequality in the corporations. The, the, the international corporations. And yeah. It, what do we What do we say about inequality? Well, about the international corporations, we say we so dare you as a slow socialist want to make a corporation called the federal government larger and stronger and completely monopolistic. That's one way to answer them. These are not knockdown arguments. The fact is that real inequality has fallen. In the first place, worldwide, it's fallen with the economic growth in China and India and, and other, some other places. But even inside countries like the United States, in, in in substance, it's declined. Now it's true that Lillian Betancourt, the heiress to the L'Oreal fortune, the richest woman in the world, has a bunch of stupid diamonds in her jewelry box that she never wears, and ch chateaux she doesn't ever visit, and yachts she doesn't go on because she gets seasick, and so forth. She's got all these toys, but basic goods are much more equally spread than they were in, say, 1800 or 1900 or 1960. Things have improved for poor people. In, in, uh, when I was young, poor people, there were, there were actually people starving in the United States. There were actually people grossly malnourished. Now they're, everyone, including me, are overnourished. Um, uh, there was no air conditioning. Take that as a simple case in point. Um, there were horrible uh, heat waves in Chicago and Washington and so forth that re resulted in hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of deaths. Um, and then air conditioning first came to movie theaters and then my parents got an air conditioner in their, in their bedroom in 1956. And now it's commonplace. It's interesting. There's also no rich man's air conditioning. There's no like There's I have, no rich I have man's a super air high level air. There's exactly. also no rich man's iPhone, which exactly. I think is super interesting. Exactly. Everyone, every, you know, I, I, I don't want to say everyone because look, there are poor people. I supported two homeless people in my home for four and a half years in my own home, and I still uh, said I, I, I still give I still tithe to my to my, my Episcopal church, and they're a very efficient uh, um, charity, and they do very good work. So I'm, I'm, I'm as I told you, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bleeding heart libertarian. I, I want the poor to be better off, but as far as this inequality thing is concerned, aside from envy about the diamonds, which is silly, I mean, why, why, envy is insatiable. Um, What's the real problem here? And there's not a problem. There's not a serious problem. Uh, the, the poor are much better off than they were 50 years ago or 30 years ago. And I want that to continue. And the main way for it to continue is to have economic growth. So when people complain about inequality and systemic inequality and growing inequality, I really – get the sense that it's not so much that there's rich people with baubles that yeah. poor people don't have, um, but that they, they almost adopt like a – take a line out of Michael Walzer's spheres of justice yeah. um, and say that the issue is not that there's – within the sphere of money, some people have a lot more than others, yeah. but that having a lot more bleeds into other spheres. And so yeah, what yeah. it turns into yeah. is disparities in, in power, yeah. that the rich can get their way and yeah. the poor can't or the rich can exploit the poor and the poor can't do anything about it. And the, the wealth disparity is both a cause and a symptom yeah, of that, but it's not itself the real problem. Yeah, of, of all the – Communitarians, Mike is the most deep. Um, Sandel, for example, at Harvard is not deep. He's, a, he's an inch deep. Um, and yes, there is a danger there. But, but as, as Mike has said in print, he, he was asked, is, is um, capitalism corrupting? There, there is a book that asks that. And he, or the market. Is the market corrupting? And he said, yeah, it is. And then he said, and so are all the other alternatives. The socialist, 
or, or the populace, let's say, who makes crazy promises. I was talking to the Uber driver about it this week as I came over this morning. That, that, that's 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 corruption too. And then his it ends up that his family is better off, uh, as in the case of Trump. So, <laughs> and I think that's a very wise remark. And from a from an Abrahamic and, and, and Christian perspective, I have no trouble with that. That's original sin, dears. P um, people, t power tends to corrupt, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So we need to make sure that market economy, we need to help market economies to be competitive and to, in the, and to uh, free entry and the, you have to break apart monopolies uh, like, like the doctors. Um, mean the, the plumbers. AMA. I mean the AMA, yeah. uh, American Medical Association, and so. And when have the rich not been the rulers? Uh, Gabriel Kolko, a mm -hmm. new left historian back in in the sixties, wrote about the ICC, the the, the um, Interstate Commerce Commission, which was to leash the railways and prevent them from um, exploiting the farmers. And in fact, they did the opposite. They got captured as Colco uh, documented very quickly by the railways. Instead of reducing fares, they raised fares. And then they got to re regulate trucking as well. So, so it was, it, and we at at the University of Chicago Economics Department, we're delighted at Colco. So here's a man of the left. We're supposed to be on the right. I don't think we really were, but we're supposed to be on the right. And he and we were ag agreeing, namely that um, that uh, that well, we, we we called it the golden rule. Those who have the gold rule. And we hated it as much as Colco and the and the and, and the New Left did. Does liberalism, if it's working well in the sense of growing betterment, as you uh, you know trade tested betterment, yeah, does it contain the seeds of its own demise in the sense by producing enough wealth that people start wanting to take it? Because it seems if everyone's toiling in the field, yeah, a you're not taking things for granted, and I think yeah. people start to take wealth for granted in a in yeah. an affluent liberal society, yeah, and b you understand that everyone else is also working in the field, yeah. But then when you start seeing oh, there's a hedge fund manager yeah, yeah. who doesn't he's, he's working in the field, but he's behind the hedge, he's behind the hedge, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> touche. So and and you say well, I don't see what he's doing now. He's yeah, he's yeah. managing that hedge and he's making yeah, yeah. a lot of money, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so now we can just take away. Yeah, that's right. And and and. But this, as you know, is an old theme in the in the in the study of modern society. Uh, Marx said that uh, uh, ca capitalism would raise its own uh, own grave diggers, and uh, uh, lots of people have made this point. Schumpeter did. Uh, Schumpeter did, and what's his name, the sociologist did. And I just don't think it's inevitable. I think we can rage, rage against the dying of the light. And I, but but it is a problem. It's this problem that we grow up in socialist societies. They're called families, and so every generation has to be taught again. Especially now, we we as you said, we grow up in families that are very far from production. If you grow up in a farm or in a or in a small 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 business you kind of understand there's no such thing as a free lunch you got to work to get more more medical care you can't just say you can't just raise the minimum wage to a hundred dollars an hour and we'll all be better off you, so, and, and you know what prices do you kind of understand the economy I find my students who come from farms and s s small businesses catch on to economics much faster than I did and there are a lot more eyes <laughs> in the economy now than there were when I graduated from college in 64 and a ton more than there were in 1900. One third of the American population was on farms in 1800, 1900. So people who just sort of don't understand their, their they just, academics or their lawyer fathers or that, things that's like right. that. That's right. And it's not, it's, not as, uh, it's not just the 
It's not just the pointy head intellectuals. If your dad and mom goes off to the office and you have no idea what it means or what it, or even, even if you go visit the office, and that's nice, uh, <laughs> take your daughter to work day, you still don't understand what mom is doing. She's talking on the phone a lot and you don't know what that's all about and what it has to do with the meat that comes to you in a nice cellophane package in the store and you think that's where meat comes from. Where does meat come from? It comes from the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> On the the question of poor um, and and the role of government in their lives. Um, so on the you know on the left, they say we need to effectively financially help the poor yeah, because and, and I'm I'm actually in favor of that right. in in some circumstances a hand up a hand out sure. in the right circumstance. But you you write in the essay that what we really need to do is is kind of get out of their way yeah. is let them is trust them to much more know what's right for them but yeah. so on the this i mean this is an argument that gets traditionally made more on the right is that do the poor know what's best for them um do i mean don't they aren't there there are people classes of people individuals who really do need their lives yeah. guided by someone who knows better and i'm thinking i, I mean in part like so we saw the 2016 election to some extent was um, a whole bunch of people who were not the the elites yeah, fed up with the elites telling them what to do or telling them what they couldn't do, and yeah. so so lashing out and saying, "No, we know what's best." Yeah, but then, but then their their things that they picked as the "we know what's best" would be catastrophic, not just for the elites but for themselves. Yeah, um, and so is there? I mean, do we have? Can we kind of trust them to run their own lives? Well, you know, that's the as you said, that's the conservative line. It's also the left wing line, and we. Um, we, people from Cato and so forth, we think that there's a third possibility, where that they're not, um, we, we don't believe in compulsion. We don't believe in violence. We're in favor of persuasion, of sweet talk, as I call it. And we believe that people should be left alone on the, on the whole. You know, so it was said that these people can't take care of themselves about women, about blacks, about colonial people. In Holland, where I've lived for a number of years, they they used to say at the height of the uh, of the Dutch Empire, mainly what's now Indonesia, they um, they said this would be around 1900. The standard line was, "Well, we're no longer extracting." tremendous amounts from Indonesia, although in some ways they still were. We're their guardians. And then you'd say, well, how long is that going to go on? Oh, about 200 years, said the Dutch. The well-meaning Dutch, the left, at least of the kind of imperialists, viewed it this way. So I, I just think this, this business of uh, people not Taking care of themselves is 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 not good. The pr Protestant uh, Reformation was mainly significant for the making of the modern world, not the way Max Weber said it was by changing people's psychology and making them more afraid they weren't going to get into heaven or something. But it's mainly church governance. Instead of the priest saying, "We'll take care of this." You don't need to bother. It was the priesthood of all believers, especially on the radical side of the uh, Reformation. You write about some some. You say it a little obliquely, sometimes directly, but we say sometimes libertarians are taking bad rhetorical tactics, and I think they you are. kind of say that sometimes they actually champion selfishness and they of do. a sort that is this not— This is the Ayn Rand problem. The Ayn Rand problem. That's how I think of it. So what So what, what sort of libertarians are you finding out there, and what are the kind of mistakes are they making other they than gotta that? they got to stop saying, screw you, I'm rich. That's what the country club says, and that's just not an intelligent way of talking because we don't— at least I, and I think it's true of both of you, we don't want to disdain the poor. 
We want them to do well, and we want them to flourish in a free society, the kind of society that can be, um, as, um, as Langston used, the great African-American poet said, an America that can be and should be. And it's, it, uh, it's a good, sensible, practical vision. It can be done. And if, if, we, if we keep sneering at the poor this way, that's not a good move. And, and it, it, the, what we should be saying, what Cato should have emblazoned on its front, uh, the front of the, yeah. the building is um, we want to help the poor. Every speech we give, every article we write, we think that uh, this regulation or that in the federal government is a bad thing because it hurts the poor. And that should be our focus. And then we can take the middle as Emmanuel M Macron, we hope, we pray, in, of all places, France. Henry, Henry Kissinger once joked, um, France is the only successful communist country because <laughs> it's been centralized for four centuries. They've been working on it. You also write that you think that in our rules for rhetoric, you think that we also, we need to make sure that we talk about criticizing conservatives just as much yeah, as we I think we I th think we need – what liberals, real liberals or, or uh, um, bleeding heart li liberals or – whatever wanted should be doing is getting away from being placed on this one spectrum on the right because when i announce that i'm a i'm a libertarian people say oh you're a conservative i say no i'm not um hayek has a friedrich hayek's essay at the end of the constitution of liberty is an essay, quite good essay why i am not a conservative and we ought to keep on. As, as he points out, it's quite interesting. He's got a good, good way of formulating it. He says that conservatives have great faith in evolution up to the present. <laughs> that all the things that evolved, all the, the English Constitution, everything, ah, oh, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. It evolved. That's a good thing. But they're terrified of future evolution. And that's where Hayek disagrees with them. Well, it seems to me sometimes conservatives are socially planning – they're socially planning where the left is economically planning and, yeah, that's and right. if they're trying to, that's right. for that's example. Right. That's right. Free on the social side, free on the economic side. We're the party of freedom. We're the real radicals and we can, we can, we can um, harness the imagination of the young in a way that these old farts, if you'll pardon the expression, can't. <laughs> I once did a debate on, on marriage for gay marriage yeah, against yeah. a conservative and I just started talking about divorce law, which conservatives oh. have been playing with forever, re resisting no-fault divorce and things like yeah, this. Yeah. And, and it, really that's just uh, – if you're – Fixing the rules of divorce, you're just price fixing the exit cost of marriage of course you in, are. A, in a social planning problem that's just as a uh, perversion of, of Hayekian principles of as any I, other I, sort of price fixing. I express it that the uh, the conservatives want to get into our bedrooms, and the slow socialists want to get into our, our our businesses, and I think they should lay off both of them. Are we, I guess, so far as direction goes? headed in the right way. I was struck, um, I think yesterday, that I saw that a survey of voters in 2016 mm -hmm. um, came out that put them on the, the standard like economic social liberty right. quadrant chart right. and then had dots for chart. like for where they where they voted, who they voted, Trump yeah. or Hillary and then yellow for other and there weren't a lot of yellows. Yeah. And what was really striking was First, the the unsurprising thing that in the in the maximal freedom on both, there were almost no voters. Yeah. Um, but that the this kind of standard line that that the conservatives are for economic freedom, but not for social freedom. Yeah. And then the um, progressives are for social freedom, but not for economic freedom, was not borne out by this data at all. Oh, really? That in fact, what you saw was that the conservatives were so the people the Trump voters, yeah. all the red dots, were clustered. Yes. Very low on social freedom, right? But also were 
very much like they were basically in the middle on economic freedom. Yeah, yeah. Like they've been they leaned against economic freedom. Yeah, yeah. And then the the liberals were in Not a similar the liberals, the, 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 sorry the progressives were yeah. in a, in a similar boat that they they yeah. didn't care about economic freedom but their social freedom wasn't terribly high either. either. Yeah. Um and so and that seems to be I mean it, anecdotally with the the rise of the the waves of protests on campus yeah, yeah. Um, and the the economic populism on the right. Yeah. Are we drifting you know, because it used to be like, well, at least each group was kind of half good. Yeah. But now it feels like the groups are there's no that's, good. Th that's an interesting observation, and it sounds it kind of accords with what I can see. Well, Brian Kappa calls it the median voter is a national socialist. Yeah, yeah, the median voter is a national socialist. There were three ideas that the intellectuals, or I call them the clerisy, have had in the last three centuries. One was very good. It was the 18th century idea from Voltaire to Mary Wollstonecraft of, l of liberalism, of freedom. The other two were nationalism and socialism. They were invented in the 19th century and they were terrible ideas. And then if you, if you like them, you, you ought to try national socialism, <laughs> which as, as Brian says- Double your pleasure, double your fun, yeah. That's right, double your pleasure, double your fun or quadruple your fun. So, um, well, I don't know. I I think that the um, that that the demonstration effect of successful liberalism, say in India or Ch or China, so far as economic um, freedom is concerned, is 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 pretty powerful. You know. We can screw it up. We did in August of 1914, and the and European Civil War began, which ended kind of in 1989. Um, so that's why we need to have programs like this. We need to talk up economic freedom and social freedom and try to get people to move off of this, I agree, this kind of fascist um, – consensus that they have. Um, so let's, you know, I, I'm optimistic about how fast culture can change, how fast political culture can change. The United States in the First World War was an isolationist power, didn't think it was a good idea to intervene, and, and then within months with uh, a very skillful um, uh, guy in charge of propaganda for the government, it switched. And we were f forbidding people to give sermons in German, just like- Or to teach their kids German. Or to I'm teach I'm... their kids German or to speak German in public. And so these things move very fast and it, gay rights, for example didn't move at all and then woof, changed. And so if we keep at it, I mean, we, the kind of elite clerisy, um, can only do a little bit. The, as they say in country music, the, the rubber meets the road with, with the popular culture, with the movies, with, uh, with, uh, the, uh, country music, indeed, with rock music, and and uh, you know, it's not so much the New York Times which foretells the future, but the New York Post, and and we've got to get those people going in the right direction. I've seen a couple of movies in the last couple of years which encourage me. Um, joy about Joy Mangano, the inventor of the self-squeezing mop, which was a pro-capitalism movie. And the other one was this one about, about McDonald's with- uh, The Founder. Yeah, The Founder is an excellent movie. I didn't quite see the end of it, so I'm not sure if it was entirely pro-capitalist, <laughs> but it was a lot better than, than the Wall Street movies. So we got to keep at it. It seems that we also can be optimistic about things like Uber, or Airbnb, absolutely. Because I and always say that there's a big gap between our 
position papers, our op-eds, yeah, yeah. listening to free thoughts. And because a lot of people just don't consume any of that. But if they ride Uber and they suddenly d- demand, they say, That's don't right. take away my Uber. Don't, don't do right. well, taxi cab cartel. There's a taxi cab cartel. They just learned. You know, they didn't even know before. They didn't and even they, know and they won now Uber they know now. It, and it's, by the way, it's, it's uh, spreading all these lies about Uber. It's clear that that's the source. Um, speaking of the, it's the sort sort of the the deep state of uh, of the t- uh, uh, of the taxi monopolies. But I I heard a very interesting talk by an entrepreneur in the um, in the the computer industry. In fact, I got a I have a friend in the computer industry too, and he says the same thing that compu- that computer stuff is ahead of the regulators. Now, power generation, medicine is not ahead of the regulators. It's the, the, the regulators have been, have been sitting on that like some giant toad for a century. But uh, the computer people are so creative and are making up stuff every day, new apps, new this, new that, and Washington hasn't quite figured, or Springfield for that matter, hasn't figured out how to stop it. Uh, and, and so may, maybe there's some optimism on that side of the economy. The problem is in these traditional industries, the, uh, the, the regulation is so heavy. That's my only positive hope for the, for the uh, Trump administration, if it lasts very long, is that it will deregulate now. We'll see if he can actually do anything at all. <laughs> yeah, it's not, so it sounds like you're making um, – our, our colleague Jason Kuznicki published um, a book about the, the history, the concept of the state and he makes what I think he refers to in the book as a state in the gaps yeah. argument, riffing off of the God in the gaps argument yeah. um, that you know the state is basically when we don't know how to solve something – um, we just kind of fill that in with yeah, the state. Yeah, but that, that was dangerous in theology. Sure. I, have, I know but, something but about no, so he, so it. It sounds may like, be dangerous in politics too. Yes. So, so he agrees. Yes. So, but, but so what we're saying with the, the technology I think then is that the, the, one of the values that it has is it kind of shrinks those gaps. Yeah, that's like right. Those, those areas that we didn't think like you can't do this thing without the government because the technology moves so fast because you can deploy an app so quickly whereas you yeah. can't deploy like a new power system or a new cancer yeah. drug quickly. Yeah, that's um, right. You can, people can latch on and can see well, it in their own lives. And, and I, I just wrote an essay available on, on my website that about economics. I'm going to be – presenting it to the History of Economic Society in a couple of days in, in Toronto. And I point out that since 1848, the way p- economists, academic economists have made their reputation is by pointing out imperfections, one after another. Uh, ignorant consumers who don't know that they shouldn't consume alcohol, say, or monopolies in the 1890s, that was the big talk. Uh, externalities and economies of scale in the 1920s, the tendency to um, endless unemployment in the 30s, uh, bad investment in the 40s, uh, um, uh, informational asymmetries. My f- friend, J- my friend George Akerlof got a Nobel Prize for that, and Joe uh, J- 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 Joe um, Stiglitz. He's also a nice guy, but he's a fool in so many ways. And I point out in this essay that none of these have been shown to be important. Yet at the same time that economists have been listening, I, I, I found, I, I, I chronicled, hear this, 105 imperfections. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just go to Samuelson's the, book for every exactly, year? Exactly. This every is long. Edition. You, you, I was educated in Samuelson's book. By the way, he was my mother's longtime mixed doubles partner, in case you care. Now, that and, is the best piece of <laughs> random trivia I've ever heard. <laughs> and and um, d- that's right. <laughs> Paul in the book spends, you know, five minutes on supply and demand. And then he spends the rest of the book talking about how it doesn't work. Monopolistic competition. I was a student of Edward Chamberlain at Harvard in the, in the 60s, and he, that was his thing. And on and on, and now inequality. 
the alleged inequality, which I don't think is correct. I did a long review of Piketty's book. Now, so, but meanwhile, this terribly imperfect capitalism, exchange-tested betterment, increased the real income of the average worker by a factor of 30. Three, that's 3,000% 3, since 1800 in most countries, a little since the United States in 1800 was already one of the richest countries in the world, a little less for us, but say a factor of 20, 2,000%. <laughs> what? What? This imperfection, and that's the problem. That's the scientific problem. They haven't when they propose when when a physicist proposes an amendment of Newton's laws, he, namely Einstein, tells how big it's going to be. Says, "Look, for things moving at close to the speed of light, such and such will be true, and light itself will bend around the sun to this extent." And economists never do it. They say, oh, woe is me, there's monopoly, we've got to bring the government in. Woe is me, there's informational asymmetry, we've got to bring the government in. Woe is me, people don't have enough education, we've got to bring the government in. That's funny. Always the solution is to bring the government in to fill the gaps. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.